The Stanley Parable is a game that I have many critical thoughts about. It's a walking simulator, which is not a genre I'm very fond of, but I'm open to any kind of genre of game. It also does not have any of the elements that I consider a good video game to be, which makes it a very interesting game to talk about, as I can't really approach it as I have any other game or any other review I've done. This is a game that is loved by many, and for good reason. It's very well written, but does that itself make it a good game? Well, the only way to find out is to press on and play the game itself. The Stanley Parable starts off with a cutscene introducing the character of Stanley. This is all narrated by Kevin Brighting, who has a very distinct British accent. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427, and he pushed buttons. The music in the background also sets the tone quite well. It's very upbeat music and lets you know what kind of game this is going to be. The basic gist of the story is that Stanley works in an office building where he pushes buttons on his computer and his computer screen tells him what buttons to push and how long to push them for. And then one day, for some unknown reason, the screen stops displaying what buttons to push. This confuses Stanley and nobody shows up to explain what's going on. So Stanley mans up and decides to get from his desk and figure out what's going on. Right off the bat, let's talk about the mechanics of the game. There aren't any. I mean, you can walk, crouch, press buttons, um, you can jump, well, you can't jump, um, yeah, that's kind of it. Now, this doesn't really represent a very positive message to me. There are many games out there with very basic mechanics, but this is just nothing. Even other walking simulators have managed to have more mechanics than this game. Those games sucked, however, so I don't know if I would really be fond of that kind of style. And many would argue that maybe a video game doesn't need to have that kind of gameplay, but I would argue otherwise. You see, in my opinion, what makes a good single-player game is three specific things. Challenging gameplay. There has to be an obstacle for the player to overcome, and the higher the obstacle, the more rewarding it is to overcome it. Balanced gameplay. Gameplay that doesn't unfairly punish the player or set an unfair challenge upon them. And three, understandable gameplay. This means that your gameplay is well explained and designed in a way so that the player can adapt to it as the game progresses and eventually gets harder. Now obviously there are some games and even some genres of games that these rules can't really be applied to, but I think this can be generally applied to most games out there. I mean not every game is created equal and expectations are different, so that's something to keep in mind during this critique. But anyway, the Stanley Parable fails at all three of these categories, and I won't immediately label it as a bad game without taking the rest of the experience into consideration, but it is something worth noting. This game puts the story and writing first, which does not sit well with me, but more on that later. The issue with this game is that there is so many branching paths to choose that it's hard to decide which order to talk about them in. I guess I'll talk about them in the order I did them. So the first path I chose during this playthrough was disobeying the narrator, which he increasingly becomes angry about. At first, he allows you to walk through the employee lounge and gives you the option of getting back on track. Now, if I did have any issues with this path, is that if you take this early game like I did, then it can feel a bit overwhelming. I love having multiple options, but when you have so many options put upon you this early in the game, it can feel like a bit too much pressure is being put on you. Though many would argue that this could be a good thing, as it makes the decisions the player makes more impactful, but none of the choices are locked away from you at any point, so you can go to them afterwards. So it isn't a massive issue on the first time playthrough, but it can feel a bit uncomfortable. Which is not really the kind of feeling I want to experience when playing this kind of game. I mean, the Stanley Parable isn't meant to be the kind of game where you feel uncomfortable. If you continue to the next room, the narrator proceeds to insult Stanley. Eventually you end up in a facility with trucks and boxes. You can stay on the platform which will lead to a room with a phone, which will take you to Stanley's supposed apartment with his wife. Turns out he doesn't have a wife, it's just a maniac, <coughs> I mean, mannequin. What I do like is that if you try to walk away, a brick wall comes up. Goodbye, Logic. Might as well just have the words fuck off written on the wall. What I do like is that the narrator talks more about Stanley and his life, and how he's destined to push buttons pretty much forever. I like this quite a lot. It isn't very subtle, but it is a nice hint towards the fact that Stanley's job is just to push buttons, and that's exactly what you do when playing a video game. The apartment slowly turns into Stanley's office, which is something I need to mention is that each time you approach an ending, the game resets after the ending finishes. 
Going backwards a bit, if you chose to jump off the platform, then it'll take you to a room with a red door and a blue door. Boy, someone who's colorblind must hate this part. If you walk through the red door, then you'll keep walking in circles until the narrator opens two doors. You then get transported to a room with some new age music and glowing lights and... Ah, this is relaxing. However, if you continue, then you'll come to a staircase where the narrator keeps shouting at Stanley to not go up, and yet Stanley keeps throwing himself off the edge. Though you can make the narrator happy again if you go back to the relaxing room. If you proceed to keep jumping off, then Stanley will die and the game resets. This ending is funny and I like it a lot, plus the music is very soothing. There is also another ending where if you jump off the platform, the narrator will say this. But in his eagerness to prove that he is in control of the story and no one gets to tell him what to do, Stanley leapt from the platform and plunged to his death. Good job, Stanley. Everyone thinks you are very powerful. <laughs> ah, okay. If you go through the blue door, the game starts to break the fourth wall. You will come to a room full of developer textures. The narrator gives you a third choice, but you can choose any of the three options and it will take you to a room where you can rate it out of five. Well, I guess DW Terminator will like this. He then promotes a leaderboard with fake stats and you're the lowest. After playing it again, Stanley is then transported to a room with a baby game. Now, there is an ending that happens if you play it for four hours, like the narrator says, but why would I play this game for four hours? Only someone with no social life whatsoever would do that. Oh. Oh, wait. The game is that you need to keep the baby from reaching the fire. If it reaches the fire, then you lose the game. Although if you look close, you can still see the faded image of the baby. The narrator becomes so angry that he loads up another game. Someone else's game. Minecraft. Ugh, really? I know Minecraft was popular around this time, but whatever. I mean, I like Minecraft, so I don't know why I'm complaining. There are some good jokes about building a house, and even the Minecraft music is here, which I do love me some Minecraft music. However, the narrator realizes that Minecraft is way too open for what he wants, and he loads up a game that I previously did a review for that someone in the comments thought was complete shite. Portal. With no portal gun. I, I seriously wonder how much they had to pay Notch and Valve to use Minecraft and Portal assets in their games. What's interesting is that the Stanley Parable actually runs on the Portal 2 engine, so this right here is essentially Portal remastered on the new engine. Though when you get to the elevator, the narrator takes it away from you, where you then drop down to a beta area and end up in the office from the original Stanley Parable mod. The screen then cuts to black and the game resets. This is one of my favorite endings. It goes on about how certain video games are structured and how that really matters which is true. If your game doesn't have an appropriate structure, then the rest of the game design will suffer because the game does not have anything appropriate to jump off of. If you took the right door at the beginning, then you can find this elevator, and if you go down it, then it leads to a room that you're not supposed to see because it's a spoiler. Now this is pretty funny, but if you've played the happy ending before reaching this ending, then it isn't really a spoiler, and thus the whole restart makes no sense. When the game restarts, there are six doors now instead of two and they all lead to endless corridors. This then leads to another restart with no doors, and then another restart where the narrator brings out a can of whoop-ass on these multiple path problems, and just invents a line for us to follow. I gotta say though, I love this visual trick of a wall appearing and disappearing. It must have really taken a lot to pull that effect off. Although it works for a certain time period, the line eventually fucks up and forces another restart. Ah, oh, god, I'm... I'm already tired of this restart gimmick. If it was just one pathway that included it, then I would have been fine with it, but it's included in multiple paths and it isn't special anymore. I'm getting sick of it. After restarting the game, Stanley and the narrator decide to ignore the adventure line, and they eventually come to a room that says this entire restart nonsense was just one big ending. Boy, I didn't see that coming. And by didn't see that coming, I, what I really meant was it was fucking obvious from the start. It is kind of funny to see what would have happened if they kept restarting the game, though. But this leads to another question that nobody really cares about. If this is a part of the ending, then if the game restarts, it should follow the schedule. And if it doesn't, then that's where the schedule should end is after the fourth restart. Well, it says after the eighth restart that Stanley dies. So I guess the next ending to talk about is the one where Stanley dies. If you choose to go downstairs instead of heading up to the boss's office, then you'll go to a room with a car and a room with clocks, which makes the obvious joke about Valve and the number three. 
because as you know, there's a there's a certain sequel out there that uh, we've we've been waiting for for uh, over ten years, and it it's never gonna happen. But I really want it to. The narrator keeps talking about Stanley's imagination and how he can do what he wants because everything here is a dream. He begins to fly, and then he is in space. But then Stanley tries to wake himself up, and it turns out that Stanley is going crazy and running around the streets, and then he collapses and dies on the floor, with a person named Mariella standing over Stanley's body. I don't really have any complaints about this ending, only that I wish the game did more manipulation of the player's movements and visibility, because I truly think it could have led to something really creative and interesting. But I mostly wish this just because of the fact that most of the game is just walking down one of five billion paths. Now yes, visually and narratively they are different, but in terms of gameplay, all you're doing is walking and pressing a button or two. Really isn't very fun. People like to talk about the broom closet when they talk about their favorite moments from the Stanley Parable, but I don't really have anything all that funny to say about it. Oh wow, it's really funny that the player is staying in a broom closet. He's doing sweet F.A. Oh, did you get the broom closet ending? Yeah, whatever, I don't really care. This is one of the only instances where I don't really like the writing, because for the most part, the writing and timing of certain jokes is spot on, but this is just... nothing. The narrator also says... Hello, anyone who happens to be nearby, the person at this computer is dead. He or she has fallen prey to any number of your countless human physiological vulnerabilities. It's indicative of the long-term sustainability of your species. Please remove their corpse from the area and instruct another human to take their place at the computer, making sure they understand basic first-person video game mechanics and filling them in on the history of narrative tropes in video gaming. But like I said, there are no mechanics in this game for the most part. Moving on, if you go upstairs, then you will reach Stanley's boss's office with a code behind it. What I do like is that if you enter the code too quickly, then New Age music starts playing. The actual name of the music is New Age B Interest by Frank Nora. Stanley heads through the door down an elevator with two options. The one right in front of you is the mind control facility where you press a button and see 500 or so screens of offices. Showing Stanley that he has been watched all this time. Once again, this room was shown earlier and you can even see the catwalk where the spoiler was. After going up the elevator, Stanley becomes to Professor Xavier's big cerebro room. I mean, it looks the same. Don't tell me it doesn't look the same, because it does. Logan, my tolerance for your smoking in the mansion notwithstanding, continue smoking that in here, and you'll spend the rest of your days under the belief that you're a six-year-old girl. You'd do that? I'd have Jean braid your hair. Oh my goodness. Patrick Stewart just threatened Hugh Jackman. He has two options. Turn it off or turn it on. If you turn it off, then the whole screen goes black and a door opens as the narrator talks all about the mysteries still left unsolved, but how Stanley does not really care because he's already satisfied with what he has. Which I think is something a lot of writers for stories need to understand when writing stories. You should answer questions, but not every question. What keeps people coming back is the mysteries and curiosity to find out more. And also just making a good game. This is the way the narrator wanted the story to end all along. This is the correct way to play the Stanley Parable. But I think it says something when people don't really want to play by the rules and find more negative options interesting. It shows that just because you have a very happy and very satisfying ending, it doesn't always make the ending appeal to everyone. Even if you do tie up all loose ends, some will just naturally gravitate towards other options. If you press the on button, then the narrator talks about how stupid Stanley is, and how the building is going to blow up. And also how it isn't a cutscene because he likes to see Stanley panic. You may think I'm taking these sentences a bit too literally, but think about it. It's true. A player can still feel tension through a cutscene, but there is more tension when it's actual gameplay as it is directly affecting you, the player, instead of a character you're playing in a cutscene. Then everything explodes. However, my favourite ending has to be this one. Before entering the mind control facility, there is a sign saying escape, which leads to a large corridor, and Stanley falls down a hole into a conveyor belt with a crusher. Before Stanley is crushed into a million pieces, the narrator keeps telling Stanley to restart the game until he is replaced by another narrator, talking about an issue that I've had with video games for many years. When every path you can walk has been created for you long in advance, Death becomes meaningless, making life the same. Do you see now? Do you see that Stanley was already dead from the moment he hit start? 
It's a question I've had about video games for a long time. Do you really have a choice on how the story plays out, especially in a game like The Stanley Parable? It may seem like a silly question to ask, but really think about it. Video games are meant to be played how they're designed, and if they're not played by how they're designed, then the person playing them will never beat them. I said this before in my Splinter Cell critique about how no matter what you do, you will always end up going down a path that has been specifically designed for that way you play the game. In order to beat a video game legitimately, you need to play by its rules, but do you have a choice if the only choice you have is to obey? When each outcome has been created long in advance for you, then your choices lack impact, as then you didn't make them. Cause and effect determines choice, which means that choice itself is merely an illusion. Yes, in gameplay you have a choice, because you can play it a million different ways, and developers can't design each of those a million different ways it can be played, but in terms of narrative, it will always play out how it was designed. No matter which route you go down, it will lead to a predetermined conclusion. Many would argue that you can choose what conclusion you want, so thus you do have choice, but that isn't really the case. If the game has already built every single conclusion in advance, you don't have a choice. So to answer the question of whether you do have choice in video games, yes and no. In gameplay you do, in story you don't. It really depends on the game. In a case like the Stanley Parable, no, you don't have a choice, because each result is predetermined. The only real choice you have is to exit the game, but by doing that, you will never beat it. Once again, cause and effect. Many will disagree with my philosophy, but hopefully it has given you something to think about, and by that I mean it has confused you, and make you think I'm an idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to video games, which is also true. Anyway, this room is my favourite because it shows off the development of the Stanley Parable, which is one of my favourite things to look at when it comes to video games. You get to see how certain areas were designed, ideas that were cut, ideas that were changed, sound effects, credits, and many more. You then return to the conveyor belt in which you get it crushed and a black screen stays on the screen indefinitely, until you press the button to restart. If you make it to the boss's office and then head back out the doors before they close, then the right door next to Stanley's office will open, in which you walk up a large area of floors with the same room. My theory is that these rooms represent each playthrough of the game, and that each time you restart it loads another floor. Anyway, you eventually find an escape pod exit and, ah fuck it, bugged out. Strange thing is that this is the only ending in the game which has no dialogue from the narrator. Although if my theory is correct, then when you jump out the windows of the regular office, then you should be able to see this staircase too. Instead, you get transported to a room that pokes fun at breaking out of the map glitches that many video games have. I used to do this a lot in video games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. I looked up all the ways you could break out of every single map, and it was really fun. Okay, this ending is really funny. If you know video games, then you'll know that the vast majority of them on PC have console commands. In games like Half-Life, for example, this allows you to shoot up all the scientists at the beginning. Developers use console commands for different reasons, mainly just to test out certain things. In the Stanley Parable, if you go into the console and try and activate cheats, then you get transported to the serious room. This honestly made me cry of laughter. These kinds of fourth wall breaks are great, and they're the kind that can only be done in video games. I love them. There is another end in which you must find a load of computers saying, Input Required, and after finding five of them, you then get transported to this room. Yeah, I don't really have much to add to it. And finally, the real ending to the Stanley Parable. I know I said the freedom ending is the correct ending because it's the way the game was supposed to be played out, but this is the real ending. If you get to the phone and unplug it, then this video appears. Choice. It's the best part of being a real person. But if used incorrectly, it can also be the most dangerous. For example, in this scenario, a hypothetical real person named Stephen has a choice. He could spend years helping improve the quality of life for citizens of impoverished third world nations. Or he could systematically set fire to every orphan living in a 30 kilometer radius of his house. Which choice would you make? Remember that unlike here, the real world makes sense. And at no time should you make a choice that does not conform to rational logic. 
If you find yourself speaking with a person who does not make sense, in all likelihood, that person is not real. Allow the person to finish their thought, then provide an excuse why you cannot continue talking. Turn to a partner and practice saying, my goodness, is it 4.30? I'm supposed to be having a back sack and crack. My goodness, it's 4.30. I'm supposed to be having a back sack and crack. Excellent. Making choices on a regular basis is the best part to a healthy decision-making process. Most medical professionals recommend making at least eight choices per day. Do you make more than eight? Less? And finally, if you begin to wonder if your choices are actually meaningful and whether you'll ever make a significant contribution to the world, just remember that in the vast infiniteness of space, your thoughts and problems are materially insignificant and the feeling should subside. At this time, your instructor will guide you in an exercise to test and reinforce the material covered in this video. Also, if you're under the age of 96, then one, you're too young to be watching my videos. And also, if you don't know what a back second crack is, then, uh, don't look it up. After taking the cargo lift, which now has fencing around it, because your choices supposedly matter now, which we've already established they fucking don't, you then go to the whiteboard room, and it's messed up, and the narrator is forced to shut the game down. After that, you spawn in a room which is damaged and appears to be moving around, which reminds me of the opening of Portal 2. The narrator says how we're not Stanley and how we're a real person, and that's why we didn't make the choices Stanley did, but the narrator is wrong, and the game itself proves it. The screen goes black, and then we see the choice from the very beginning of the game, where Stanley is choosing between which door to go through. The credits roll, and the narrator begs for Stanley to pick either door, but he never does. This is because we are Stanley, or at least we were until the game sliced the connection between the protagonist and the player. Stanley is a silent protagonist, and because of that he has no personality. We construct our own personality onto him. We make him think and do as we wish. And eventually he becomes the player because Stanley's needs and wants are filled by the player. But because we are no longer Stanley, he's just a character model with a name. He's nothing. He's not even a he anymore. It's just a bunch of code. Silent protagonists aren't put inside games because the developers are lazy. They're there because the character will become you. The character's thoughts, feelings, and emotions become yours because the character has no personality. The narrator says that we aren't Stanley, but if we are no longer Stanley, Stanley is no longer anything. Silent protagonists are a conscious design choice. They aren't dumb because developers are lazy or don't have the money to afford voice actors. A lot of modern video games seem to forget this. They shove cutscene after cutscene, after scripted sequence after scripted sequence, down your throat to use that as a driving force of the game rather than the player's input. One thing I do like about the Stanley Parable is that it almost never takes control away from the player. I'm not against cutscenes in games, but I hate it when they're shoved down my throat, or when there's so many of them it breaks the flow of gameplay, or even replace what could have been gameplay. But now, this is where I heap shit on the game. I genuinely don't see walking simulators as a viable genre of video games. I know a lot of people will hate me for saying that, but I'm not saying I want to see walking simulators taken off the market, because they obviously do appeal to a certain demographic of people, and gamers should be allowed to play what they want. But in my subjective opinion, these are the three elements that make a good game, and there has not been a single walking simulator so far that has met any of these categories. I know many people will say that I should not be focusing on the gameplay portions of this genre of game, but I have a rebuttal to that. Now I mean no offense to anyone when I say this, but saying that I shouldn't focus on the gameplay in a video game is a really stupid thing to say. It's really fucking stupid. I know to many people, story is more important than gameplay, and if it is, more power to you. I disagree with that for reasons I will explain in a second, but I have seen many people use this argument whenever somebody criticizes a game of that favors story over gameplay. Even if the story is more important to you, is it not fair to say that gameplay is what makes a video game a video game? And thus it is completely fair to criticize a video game for having bad or even poorly designed gameplay? I think it is. Now, I'm not saying I don't want stories in video games because that's the exact opposite. Video games are the most open form of media to tell a story. Movies and books have told really great stories and so have video games, but video games have so much more potential than movies or books do. The kind of stories that can be told in video games are limitless. For movies and books, the sky is the limit for what kind of story you can tell. With video games, the Andromeda Galaxy is the fucking limit. Video games have been evolving in many ways over the past 40 plus years they've been around, from gameplay, graphics, music, online capabilities, and others. 
and stories have been evolving too. Many developers have tried telling stories in video games the exact same way movies do, so they could say, hey, we can tell and make stories that are just as good as you. Now, while I respect this, I don't think it's the right way to do it, because it means that video game storytelling and movie storytelling would end up being the same thing, and thus it would not be special at all. So instead of trying to match movies in quality, just tell a story in a way that could not be done in any other form of media except video games. Oh yeah, take that movies, you have visual storytelling? Well guess what? We have interactive storytelling! Beat that! Bitch. But seriously, I see a lot of potential for narratives in games that just isn't quite being used yet. But you want to know one game that does use it? The Stanley Parable. The kind of jokes and writing this game has can only be achieved in video game form. Now, throughout this critique, I've been both praising and criticizing the game heavily, so you may not know what I actually think about the game. In summary, The Stanley Parable is not really a great game in my eyes, but it is an experience I enjoyed and it got me to think about the way I view certain design choices in video games. It's a simple game that shows why designing a video game is not easy, and even though it may not be my cup of tea, it definitely is an experience I will never forget. If you haven't played this game yet and do want to play it, I'd say it's a game that's best played in one sitting, so you can experience all the endings at once. It's an odd game because it shows something I really hate in video games, and that is dull gameplay, but it does show the potential that video game narratives have, but unless that potential is met, this game is wasted potential. It's an experience that could have truly been a game changer for stories in video games, but it collapsed well before the finish line. There once was a man named Stanley, who people considered so manly. But the truth must be told, he was not very old, and was quite particularly gangly. What Stanley liked most was buttons. He pushed them like some kind of glutton. He did it all day in a meaningful way, but his brain had long ceased to function. Which is why he is in this parable, and lives an existence quite terrible. And if you are not strong, and keep playing along, you too will become quite unbearable. Yes. You too will become quite unbearable.